Um, so thank you everybody for coming out and thank you to Kier for uh, inviting me. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, my newest book, Platform Capitalism. Uh, and like most good academic projects, it was born out of like frustration and annoyance with other authors. Um, I was basically trying to research the digital economy and trying to learn about what platforms mean and really frustrated about the sort of lack of a clear definition about what exactly a platform means. Uh, so in part the book is an attempt to clarify for myself what exactly is going on. Uh, we see all these sorts of terms going on about you know, sharing economy and gig economy and everything, uh, but none of them seem quite adequate to me. Uh, so I begin with um, what I think is wrong with uh, some of the common terms. So oftentimes we think about, well, it's the tech sector that we're talking about uh, when we look at sort of the digital economy. Uh, most of the top co uh, companies in terms of profitability, in terms of market capitalization, uh, they're tech companies, whether it be Apple or Google or Amazon or Facebook. Uh, they're ostensibly tech companies. Now the problem with saying that this is just the tech sector, that the tech sector is revolutionizing things, uh, is that the tech sector is actually quite small. When we look at the sort of technical definitions for what the tech sector is, uh, in the US it contributes about 7% uh, of value added, and it only employs about 2.5% of the population, uh, which is just about the same as agriculture in America. So it's a very small part of America. Now, same thing, uh, <coughs> the same sort of idea holds if we look at the UK. So the UK is supposed to be a deindustrialized country, uh, and it is, but manufacturing employs three times more people than the tech sector does when we look at these strict definitions. Uh, and the tech sector is famously not high employment. Uh, Amazon being one exception, but Facebook employs around 12,000 people. Uh, WhatsApp employed 55 people and was sold for, I think it was $20 billion. Uh, Instagram employed 13 people when it was sold for, I think it was a billion dollars. So these are incredibly small companies that are worth a lot and they seem to be making a lot of noise, but their actual economic impact is relatively small when we look at the broader picture. So I don't think the tech sector is a good way to name what's going on. Now another one that we see is the sharing economy. Uh, I'm sure we've all heard of this now. Uh, it's the idea of these apps, usually, uh, that lets you share your goods and services. Uh, so you, if you have a spare room in your house, you can share it on Airbnb. If you have some spare time, uh, you can share your expertise in building IKEA furniture and stuff like that. Uh, and this is often used by proponents of things like Uber and Airbnb, uh, and it gives a sort of nice idea to what's going on. You know, this is just people freely sharing their goods and freely sharing their time. Uh, but of course, the sharing economy isn't really about sharing, uh, it's about money. Uh, these are dominated by uh, firms which have massive venture capital backing, which are in it to make money, which are in it for profits, uh, which are hyper-exploiting workers. Uh, in most cases. So it's not really a sharing economy. Uh, it's much more a traditional sort of uh, capitalist firm that's looking to exploit workers in order to generate a profit. Uh, and the sharing economy to me seems more like uh, propaganda than an accurate term for what is going on. Now another one that we see, and this takes it less from the consumer's perspective and more from uh, the perspective of the worker, it's a bit more of a critical term, uh, the gig economy. And the idea here is that we've seen a long-term shift from careers in like the 1970s to jobs in say the 1990s, and today we have a focus on tasks. So you go and you do a task and you get paid for that, but you don't necessarily have a job beyond that task, uh, and you certainly don't have a lifelong career. Uh, and this is part of a long-term trend. It's been going on for about 40 years now, uh, and this is sort of the end game uh, that you get paid by the gig rather than by uh, a job. Now the problem with using this term to sort of designate what's going on is that again, this is actually quite small. We don't have official statistics on this, so the Bureau for Labor Statistics in America doesn't actually measure this stuff directly. Uh, same with the ONS here in the UK, doesn't measure it directly. But our best estimates are that the gig economy takes up about 1% of the US labor market, and in the UK it takes up about 3%. So again, it's a quite small thing. Uh, and to say that the gig economy is indicative of this broader shift, I think uh, overstates the case for what's going on. 
So I want to say that the better term for what's happening today with the digital economy uh, is to name it something like platform capitalism. Uh, and one of my basic arguments is that platforms are a new business model. Uh, in particular, we can compare them to sort of classic ideas, uh, particularly from sort of Marxist analysis uh, of a Fordist business model and a post-Fordist business model. So the Fordist business model was premised upon mass production, uh, producing the same good many, many uh, times over, uh, mass consumption, lots of people buying that good, uh, and vertical integration as well. So an auto company would own the parts suppliers, it would own people making seats, it would own everything up to the point of sale, uh, essentially. Uh, and that's the sort of paradigmatic Fordist business model. Now in post-Fordism we see something different. So we see flexible production. Uh, we see more and more emphasis on individualizing products, uh, making them more responsive to consumer desires. Uh, and this is part of individualized consumption as well. It's not just a homogenous good being produced anymore, uh, but instead we have consumer preferences and consumer taste uh, constantly being differentiated. Uh, and I think one of the important things, particularly in comparison to a platform model, uh, is that post-Fordist business models were based upon a lean business. So the idea was that if a sector of your company was not profitable, you would cut it off. Uh, and this led to things like Nike, where basically Nike does advertising, it does branding, but it outsources everything else. So it doesn't actually control uh, the manufacturing of um, footwear and things like that. But this led to, you know, again, businesses that <coughs> had a sort of core group of people, a very small number of employees that were making a massive amount of money on the basis of branding and things like that. And that was sort of the, ar uh, the archetypal post-Fordist business model. Now this is all different from platforms. Uh, and this is a sort of definition I use uh, for what <coughs> platforms are. Uh, two key aspects, they're intermediaries and they're infrastructures. So they're intermediaries between different groups. And we can think of Facebook as an example here. Uh, so Facebook brings together users, us as we interact on Facebook, uh, combines them with advertisers, combines them with companies who have pages, uh, who are now building up, you know, little chat bots that you can interact with uh, on Facebook. Um, same thing with something like Uber. Uber is a, an intermediary between people who want a taxi and people who are able to provide uh, a taxi service. So it brings together these different groups. Uh, but platforms are also an infrastructure. So they're an infrastructure for this intermediation, uh, but also for development. You can build things on top of most platforms. Uh, so you think about Facebook, for instance, you can build your profile. Uh, if you're a company, you can build a company page. You can build apps for Facebook. Uh, so this is what platforms are all about, is bringing people on board to that platform and interacting on top of it. So that's sort of the core definition that I'm working with. Uh, now it's worth noting, this definition of platforms excludes one company that we might normally think of as part of this this sort of shift, which is Apple. It turns out Apple's actually a relatively boring company uh, in terms of what it's doing. So Apple is immensely profitable, the most profitable company in the world, but it's not that different from the post fortis Nike model of a luxury good being sold for massive profits on the basis of branding uh, and advertising. Uh, Apple has platform aspects, iTunes and the App Store, things like that, but they take up about, uh, I forget exactly how much, but it's a very small amount of their revenue stream. 68% of Apple's revenue comes from selling iPhones. So they're actually a fairly traditional company in that sense. They sell a luxury good. Uh, not all that interesting, uh, and not a platform by my definition. Now what are some other characteristics of platforms? Um, the first and most important one is that they have network effects. Uh, they generate network effects and they rely upon network effects to exist. Uh, network effects is basically the idea that the more users who use a platform, the more valuable that platform becomes for everybody else. <coughs> uh, so a good example is again Facebook. Uh, you may hate Facebook, most people do, but if you want to be on social media, you're going to be on Facebook because that's where everybody else already is. Uh, the important thing to pull away from this is to say that, to notice that network effects lead to a winner-takes-all model 
They lead to monopolization. So it becomes very difficult to dislodge something like Facebook once it's ingrained itself as the key social media platform. Uh, same thing with something like Google. It's very difficult to get away from Google as a search engine uh, because it's monopolized uh, through network effects. So this is the first aspect here. Uh, another aspect uh, is what's called cross-subsidization, uh, which is a fancy word for something we're all well aware of. It's the idea that companies will provide something for free or at a subsidy uh, in order to get more users on board and they'll raise up the prices on another element of the business. Uh, so for instance, Google provides Gmail for free, it provides its calendar for free, it provides all sorts of other things for free, but then it can jack up prices for advertisers. And part of what it means to be a platform business is to fine tune what you're subsidizing and what you're not subsidizing. Uh, another good example is Amazon. Amazon Prime loses Amazon money but it does bring people into the Amazon ecosystem. It brings them onto the platform. Uh, the Kindle is sold at cost, uh, again, to bring people into uh, the Amazon ecosystem. So these are all efforts to generate network effects uh, and get that monopoly uh, sort of tendency going on. Okay, uh, the next and final sort of characteristic of platforms uh, is that they have a designed core architecture. So the platform is not neutral, and in fact it embeds a set of rules and incentives and a system of behaviors within the platform. Uh, so platform intermediation is not neutral, it's not just two people, two groups coming together uh, with no sort of uh, just, you know, themselves basically directly. Instead there's something going on here, there's something political. Uh, my favorite example is Uber, so if you open up Uber on your phone uh, and you look around for uh, the Uber taxis that may be around, they actually show more taxis that are available than actually are available. So it's this thing called phantom cabs. They're showing more supply in the market than what's actually there. Now it's the same thing on the other side. If you're a driver, they use a system of surge pricing to predict where demand is going to be in order to get people to move to a certain area, to get drivers to move to a certain area. Now none of this is neutral, none of this is just pure market forces. This is on the basis of the algorithms within Uber's program uh, and it's a sort of political manipulation uh, of both the riders and the drivers. Uh, and this holds for all platforms as well. Okay. Now, why are platforms important? Uh, well, I think platforms are the only business model adequate to the digital age. So I think the key sort of resource today is data. Uh, and a traditional business model, whether it be a Fortis business model or a post Fortis business model, is not very good at collecting data. It can collect it as a sort of derivative effort, but it's not core to those business models to collect data. <coughs> The thing with platforms is that as intermediaries and as infrastructures, everybody is acting on them and they're in a position to capture uh, and control as much data as possible. So in getting people to go onto the platform, we then act on the platform, that means all of that data is then available to those companies. So I think platforms are a sort of apparatus for extracting and collecting data. Uh, and I think this is why we're starting to see them expand uh, across the uh, not just in the tech sector, but across the economy, um, because they are really good at collecting data. Okay, um, what I want to go through now is a number of different types of platforms. So there's a certain core aspects which hold for all of the platforms, uh, but it's also important to distinguish between different types. And this is because, particularly when I was reading a lot of the literature on platforms, uh, People would be calling Google a platform and then they'd be comparing it to Uber and they'd be comparing it to Amazon. And these things, these businesses are quite different. Their revenue sources are quite different. What they're making money from, how they're generating profits is quite different. So they may all be platforms, but we also have to take into account uh, how they are actually creating money, creating value. So I have four different types of platforms, uh, advertising, cloud and industrial platforms, product platforms uh, and lean platforms. Uh, so the first one is advertising platforms, which essentially is Google and Facebook. There's a number of others, but Google and Facebook are the primary ones here. 
And they're advertising platforms because their entire revenue stream is basically dependent upon advertising. Uh, so this is, the blue is advertising revenue for Google, uh, I believe it's 89%, uh, and Facebook it's 96% of their revenue comes from advertising. So that is where their money uh, basically comes from. There's no element of Google, so it's transformed into Alphabet now. There's no other element of Alphabet that is profitable. It's only AdWords which is actually the profitable element. Um, so these are our companies which are extremely reliant upon generating and maintaining that stream of advertising income. Now what does this mean? Uh, I think it gives them a certain structural imperative. If they are reliant upon advertising income, uh, they have to expand their data collection on users. This is fundamental to the way that they generate revenue. Uh, in order to get more advertisers, in order to say, well, we can match up your ads with the perfect consumers who are uh, going to be enticed by your ad. Now, what does this mean uh, in terms of privacy? It means that these companies, it's intrinsic to their business model to expand data collection. It means that they're going to be constantly impinging upon privacy. Uh, so you see this constantly with Google and Facebook. Uh, Google, with its Google car driving around, had this big issue where it turned out it was collecting a lot of data from people's Wi-Fi's. Mm -hmm. um, Facebook, same thing, it's constantly, you know, impinging and asking for more and more information for people. So this is, uh, it's fundamental to the business model. I think the sort of ideas that we can reform these companies in a certain way that they respect privacy misses the fact that it's structural that is intrinsic to how they generate revenue, uh, they'll necessarily impinge upon privacy. Okay. The next one is uh, what's called cloud platforms, what I call cloud platforms. Uh, and this is basically cloud computing. Uh, Amazon Web Services is the biggest one. Uh, and when Amazon Web Services goes offline, most of the internet goes offline with it. Uh, it's a huge part of the backbone uh, of the internet as we know it. Uh, and these companies, basically what they do is they provide the hardware, so computing power, uh, the development tools, and the software for other companies to use. So they rent them out. So their profit then is dependent on renting out these basic infrastructures, these basic platforms uh, to other companies. Uh, and this is becoming a huge, huge industry as well. Um, it's the most profitable element of Amazon already. Uh, Google is moving into this area as well, so it's starting to rent out its machine learning algorithms. Uh, Microsoft is developing artificial intelligence that it's going to rent out as a sort of cloud-based service. Uh, and IBM is actually working on quantum cloud computing, although who knows if quantum cloud computing, quantum computing even works. Uh, but every major company in the tech sector is moving into cloud-based stuff as well. That's a huge revenue generator, um, and we're starting to see more and more companies move to it. Now, a particular version of cloud platforms uh, is industrial platforms. So people may have heard about the industrial internet of things, uh, and it's this idea that you can connect the materials and the sensors and the parts and uh, all of a factory together into a local internet. Uh, and what this sort of local industrial internet is supposed to do is allow all these parts and machines to talk to each other so they can warn of possible maintenance issues, they can warn of um, problems that might be going on. Uh, they can also uh, introduce extreme flexibility. So BASF, the biggest chemical producer in the world, has built a sort of prototype factory on the internet of things. Uh, and they can have every product that comes out on the assembly line different from the one before it. So there's a huge amount of flexibility that can be built into these uh, uh, factories as a result. But what's particularly interesting is that you have plat uh, uh, sort of platform providers for this industrial internet. Uh, so this is GE and Siemens in particular have been spending billions now trying to build up a cloud-based platform for factories. Uh, so it's quite literally like an app store for factories uh, is what they're starting to build up. Uh, and this is um, already a sort of a big revenue source for GE. It makes about $5 billion annually uh, on its uh, Predix platform. Uh, 
and it collects more data than Facebook as well. So these are huge sort of things going on that, um, to my knowledge, haven't really been discussed yet. Uh, but again, it's renting out the platform and generating profits on the basis of that rental. Okay, uh, the third one here is product platforms. Uh, this is the idea of transforming goods into services that can be rented. Uh, probably the best example of this is something like Spotify or iTunes or Tidal, these music subscription services where basically a good that we can all get for free, you can download music for free off the internet quite easily, uh, has now been turned into something that generates a revenue stream for a company. Uh, it's quite interesting that the music industry has been seeing revenues decline for about 20 years. Last year it saw its revenues pick up again solely because of subscription-based services. So this has been turning you know, the sort of free informational goods again into something which generates money for companies. Uh, and the idea is you're renting out this stuff. So if you have you know, uh, a book on a Kindle, you don't actually own it, you're renting it. Uh, and Amazon got into some trouble a couple of years ago when they started deleting 1984 off of people's Kindles. Uh, and people not realizing that, well, you actually don't own it. Um, and Amazon can do what it wants with it. Now, one of the most interesting examples is Rolls Royce. Uh, as part of its business, it creates jet engines. And we would think a traditional sort of commodity producer produces a jet engine, sells it to an airline, uh, and then just profits off of that. Rolls-Royce doesn't actually do that. It hasn't been doing that for about 10 or 15 years now. What it does is it rents thrust rather than selling jet engines. Now, I remember the first time I heard about this, and I thought, what does renting thrust mean? <laughs> how, does that, how is that even possible? Well, basically, the ownership doesn't pass to the airline. Uh, the jet engine goes to the airline, they put it on the airplane, uh, but then for every hour that it's run, they pay a fee to Rolls-Royce. And what Rolls-Royce uh, gives back is maintenance for it. Uh, but it's also, again, its own data platform. So Rolls-Royce is collecting all the data from every use of those jet engines. Uh, it means they can make them more aerodynamic, they can make them more fuel efficient, they can see when they may run into problems, <coughs> all of these sorts of things. So jet engines have become a platform in Rolls-Royce's business. Uh, and it collects, again, an immense amount of data um, that, again, has monopoly tendencies. Other jet engine companies, if you're not doing that, you're not collecting that much data, you're losing out on that comparative advantage. So data is becoming, again, a key resource to generate a monopoly tendency and generate comparative advantage uh, against your competitors. Okay. Uh, finally, Maybe the platform that we're all most aware of uh, is what I call lean platforms. Uh, and the idea that they're lean comes from this uh, now sort of famous quote, uh, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles, and Airbnb, the largest accommodation provider, owns no hotels. So they're lean in the sense that they own very little. Uh, they own as little as possible. They're virtually assetless companies. Uh, it's quite interesting as well, Uber, uh, rents a lot of its basic computing stuff from Amazon Web Services. So one of the ways in which it's been able to rapidly scale up, you know, it's the fastest growing company ever, uh, is because of Amazon Web Services, renting out that platform to build its own platform. Uh, Mackenzie Wark has this term, uh, the vectorless class, which sort of owns information and owns the controls and uh, the flows of information. And I think that applies quite well to the owners of lean platforms. Uh, they do own very little, but they're still managing to siphon off a lot of the profit. Now the revenue here comes from two different things. It doesn't come from advertising and it doesn't come from renting out a service or a product. Instead it comes from outsourcing costs primarily. Uh, so Uber is the best example of this. The fact that uh, its workers have to take on the maintenance costs for a car, they have to take on the fuel costs, the insurance costs, uh, any sort of um, costs associated with an accident, that's not on Uber. Those costs are all outsourced uh, and no longer on Uber's books. Uh, and they're also supported by venture capital welfare. So a huge amount of money from Silicon Valley going into uh, companies like Uber and Airbnb uh, and basically supporting them uh, despite the fact that they're not profitable. Uh, Uber until a couple months ago was losing a billion dollars a year in China, trying to fight off another unprofitable competitor in China. 
This is not, you know, this is not a capitalist leading a life. This is a massively failing business that's supported by venture capital welfare to survive. The idea is that Uber over time will have a monopoly position and will be able to generate revenue and a profit, but right now it's massively unprofitable. Uh, and actually, Uber's long-term business plan is quite interesting to my mind. Um, they've spent a huge amount of money on self-driving cars. They bought up an entire academic department from Carnegie Mellon that was doing research on self-driving cars, and they're now testing it out in America, uh, in Pittsburgh. They tried to test it out in California, but California blocked them one day after they tried to do it. Uh, and I think they're in Arizona now, where the, the laws are a bit looser. Um, but if we think about this, the monopoly tendency of a platform, what this means is that Uber is aiming to get the monopoly over a self-driving taxi service. And because running self-driving cars requires so much data, you need to have real-time data on what road conditions are like, what traffic is like, uh, what construction there might be. If Uber can have a monopoly over that data, nobody can beat them. And this is why you know, venture capitalists are putting a lot of money into it, why the company is worth $68 billion. Um, because people think that if they can attain that position, it actually will be uh, a very profitable company. Uh, and it could happen. Um, I was reading the other day as well, apparently Uber is now researching flying cars, which I don't know, it sounds bizarre to me, but this is apparently the next thing that they're working on. Um, but I think one thing that's interesting to know with that, their long-term game, pl uh, game plan is not to stay as a lean platform. It's to shift into something else. They're going to own the assets. They're going to own these self-driving cars. They're going to own all of the sensors that are required to drive self, uh, have self-driving cars. So they recognize, I think, that lean platforms are not sustainable in any way. OK, so those are sort of the, the four dominant types of platforms uh, that I see today. Uh, now I want to talk about possible futures uh, to conclude. Uh, and I see sort of three possible futures. Uh, one terrible, but likely. Two nice, but unlikely. Um, and I'm going to end on a very pessimistic note. Um, so I'll start with the first one here, monopoly platforms. Uh, and again, this is just a sort of extrapolation of the tendencies that I see going on right now, uh, where network effects means that platforms tend toward a winner-takes-all model. Uh, and they consolidate their position and it becomes very difficult for uh, a newcomer to disrupt that market once they've solidified their position. The other aspect is that because they are also reliant upon data, they have a sort of structural imperative to expand their data extraction. So they're constantly looking for new ways to expand uh, and get more data. Now this, I think, makes sense of a lot of Google's business deals, it makes sense of a lot of Apple's business deals and Amazon's. You know, why is Amazon getting into the consumer internet of things? It's supposed to be an e-commerce company. Well, it makes sense if actually your business is data and you want to collect as much data as possible. Same thing with Google. Why is Google getting involved in self-driving cars, getting involved in consumer internet of things, all sorts of weird businesses that are unrelated to a search engine, but it makes sense if their business is data. And again, this goes back to the point uh, the post Fortis business model was a lean model. Cut down to your core competencies, your profitable things. That doesn't hold true for a platform. The idea for a platform is to expand, uh, and mergers and acquisitions are huge amongst these companies, huge amount of companies being bought up by them, uh, to expand and collect more data in a sort of rhizomatic way. So this is the tendency that I see occurring right now. Uh, and I think if we sort of extrapolate from that, the likely future is one of massive, expansive, closed and monopolistic platforms. So you'll be on the Google network, or you'll be on the Apple network, or on the Facebook network. Uh, I think we have actually an interesting example today of what this might look like, uh, which is WeChat. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard of WeChat at all. One, two, yeah, a handful of people. Uh, so it's very, very famous in China. It hasn't really made it over to the Western world yet. Uh, interestingly, I think the Chinese ecology of platforms is in many ways more advanced than the Western one. And if I could rewrite my book, I would probably be focusing more on them. Um, but I had deadlines and I needed to publish them at some point. Um, but WeChat is interesting because it's a sort of super app. Uh, it's a closed-in app, so it doesn't interact with other apps. Um, it doesn't, it's sort of like uh, if you're on it, then uh, it doesn't 
interact with the other ones. But it does enable other apps to work on this platform. So for instance, you could have Uber on WeChat. You could get ride sharing on WeChat. Uh, you could do financial transactions on WeChat. You can make a, an appointment with the government. You can make an appointment with the doctor. Uh, all of this is through WeChat, apps that are based within WeChat. But what this is, it's basically a meta platform, a platform for other platforms to operate on, but it then uh, uh, enables the extraction of all that data for that one super app. Uh, and I think quite interesting is revenues come from e-commerce more than advertising. Uh, advertising is not really sustainable. Uh, what we've seen is this duopolic structure between Facebook and Google basically taking all digital online advertising and everybody else struggling to get it. Uh, advertising is not really a sustainable way uh, to generate revenues unless you're one of those two companies. Uh, so WeChat doesn't rely on that and I think that's quite interesting in terms of its sustainability. Uh, now this isn't just me sort of predicting this. There's a lot of noise from people at the top of Facebook and people at the top of Google saying we want to be like WeChat actually. Uh, that WeChat is something that we want to aim towards and that we're quite envious of the way in which it works. Uh, so I think that this is sort of the likely future. We're going to see more and more of it. Um, I'll give one example, which is uh, Facebook right now is investing a lot of money into chatbots. And the idea is that through Facebook Messenger, you can interact with a business, a little, a little tiny AI, and you could say, order a pizza through Facebook. It's a little app within Facebook, and that's what they're trying to do at the moment. Whether it'll be successful or not, I don't know, but this is you know, the sort of strategy that they're thinking about. Okay, so I think this is the most likely outcome, corporate dominated monopoly platforms. Uh, there's a nicer one, which is platform cooperativism. Uh, and this is the idea of platforms owned and controlled by the workers. Uh, so for instance, you know, uh, a sort of Uber competitor, which is owned by the drivers, uh, it doesn't exploit the workers, it gives them a reasonable wage, uh, reasonable benefits, things like that. Now, I like the idea, but I think it faces some severe challenges. How do you compete against Uber in the first place? Uh, you have a company that was losing a billion dollars a year to undermine another competitor. How does the sort of bottom-up platform cooperative uh, compete against a company that is willing to lose a billion dollars a year? Uh, you can't, basically. Uh, you also have the fact that most of these companies have an immense amount of data which gives them, again, a structural advantage that you have to overcome. Uh, and finally, you have network effects. So we've seen a number of competitors rise up against Facebook, and they've all faltered and failed because of network effects in large part. Uh, they've not been able to get the mass amount of people you need to shift to another social media site, uh, and so they've, they've all failed. So that's not to say platform cooperatives are impossible, but they do have very severe challenges and I think that they're quite unlikely. Uh, and finally, we might think of something like public platforms. Uh, so if a sort of bottom-up approach doesn't work, well, we can use the resources of the state to build our own platforms. Uh, so state-owned and regulated platforms, uh, they have the money, they have the, the capacity to deal with something like Uber, or deal with something even like Google. Uh, the major problem I see here is how do you separate out a nationally owned platform from the security state? Because I'm pretty sure GA, GCHQ would love to have a nationally owned Facebook that we were all interacting on. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, the NSA would love the same thing as well. So how do we maintain that separation between the security state and the more publicly oriented state? Again, I don't think it's impossible, but I do think it's a major challenge to any idea of a public platform. Which leads me to the conclusion that uh, monopoly platforms seem almost inevitable. Uh, and maybe our best hope is that Google won't be evil. Um, it's a pessimistic conclusion, and uh, if you can think of a great idea, let me know, because I'd love to hear it as well. Uh, but as it stands, I'm quite pessimistic about the way things are going. Uh, and hopefully at least this stuff raises some awareness of it, and uh, you can start thinking about how to combat uh, platform monopolies. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you.